morning, on a very early morning here in Synthplex. So you talked in your talk yesterday about the work that you're teaching at Johns Hopkins and kind of AR and VR and its role and importance in music. Could you just talk a little bit about that, where you see the, the, the relevance of these technologies for the musician and the music? It seems to me the new frontier really in digital music uh, is not going to be in multiplying resolutions and uh, you know, all of those numbers are going to take care of themselves. You know, Moore's law will give us you know, better CPU and uh, better resolution and more storage and things like that and faster bandwidth. But the issue for me is that all of these musical building blocks are dumb. They have no knowledge of each other. You know? So if I, if I play a sample and put it in place and I bring in another sample, it goes where I put it and it plays at the volume I play it at, but it has absolutely no understanding of the, of the first sample, so it's not listening. Um, conversely, um, when you look in nature and you look at any kind of a, a school of fish or a murmuration of sparrows or, or you know, a, a, a fireflies in the, in the jungle, you know, that they're, they have a sort of hive mind. I mean, they're all acutely aware of each other to the extent that from a distance, they appear to be moving as one. Now you get very much the same sense when you watch a great orchestra, a world-class orchestra, and it, it's almost like watching a, a school of fish, you know, you see their bows moving and so on. And that's because those orchestral musicians are using all of their senses to listen very acutely and be aware, not only of the resonances of their own instrument, but their neighbor's instrument, the stage around them, the reflections that are coming back from the room, you know, all led by the conductor. And the conduct, they react to the conductor almost like a school of fish react to a predator. Um, and, uh, and it's constantly being updated too, it, isn't it? It's a moment by moment, it's, it's not yeah, just it, even a static it, it, interaction. It's, it's in microseconds and it's not, it's not a conscious thing. Right. It's something that you just do. And I, and I sort of liken this to balancing, you know, like a, a, a broomstick on the, on the tip of your finger. You're not thinking left a bit, right a bit, and so on. There's, there's just a continuous loop between your, your synapses and the tip of your finger, and similarly with the, you know, the pads of a violinist's um, fingers. So, uh, but in music, we have wave files. You know, we have um, we have chunks of audio uh, that we, we drop into place, and we 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 tune them afterwards, and we we mix them and we add effects to them and things like that, but they're completely unaware of each other. <clears throat> and I think that's unnecessary, you know, I think that maybe the next frontier is that actually we need to have a more conscious unit of sound which takes into account, you know, the context in which it is playing. And I think that would be a very interesting area to explore. What's the relation, I mean, there is a relation between that and kind of spatial audio, which is very much audio mindful of a, you know, a 360 degree universe, it's not just stereo or even, or even surround. Um, do you think, how, how do you think those will relate sort of music part by music part and also music part in full context? I, I think there's definitely a, a relationship um, because, you know, spatial audio in an immersive environment is reacting to sort of variables like the position or the behavior of a character or a sprite in a game for example um, with in the context of the physical space that they're in you know the surfaces of the floor and the walls and, the, and reflections of those and our proximity as the as the listener to the, the the action and things like that so that already is is putting a new kind of <coughs> um, requirement on the characteristics of audio that, that it needs to be more sort of contextual. Um, and so I think that, that the work that's being done in spatial audio is gonna bring about new standards in terms of uh, you know, audio file formats and, and delivery formats and real-time performance um, parameters, uh, which I think can come right back to sequencing, sampling, synthesis, and so on. And, um, and that's gonna be very exciting. Mm -hmm. How do you think the consumer, if you will, will consume this? I mean, do you, do you believe in the kind of headset philosophy or do you believe more it's kind of retinal or, or you know, ambient space? How, yeah. how do you think we're yeah. going to... Um, <clears throat> well, I think we're going to cross the chasm as far as, you know, VR headsets and AR headsets go. 
in the next couple of years. Um, shortly there is a, a new headset coming out from Oculus called the Quest, which is wireless. And getting rid of the tethers is going to be a huge thing. It looks out instead of looking in, so you don't need lighthouses. And that means that you know, right here I could put in a headset and be you know, aware of, of information, you know, enhanced, augmented information that's going on around me. Uh, and the price point is very low, you know. So, so I think that's going to actually, you know, create a breakthrough in, in sort of immersive entertainment, uh, which is which is pretty thrilling. Uh, beyond that, um, people are going to get frustrated with the clunkiness, you know, of, of headsets and the fact that you look like a bit of a dork. You know, right, going around on. like Darth Vader. Um, but you know, if you go down to Magic Leap and you look at their sort of next generation plans for the future, um, two or three generations down the road. Everybody's going to look like Thomas Dolby because you know the <laughs> <laughs> that was my thought you know, too. The, yeah. like, one you know, that looks know, like you, right? Ma yeah. Magic Leap, you know, mm -hmm. version three or version right. four looked pretty much like one it, of these. Yeah. Other areas of wearables are also quite interesting. Um, I have a pair of the Bose Frames glasses, which just look like a cool pair of sunglasses, um, you know, but are AR enhanced. So I'm using them as, you know, remote uh, headphone for, for my phone, but I'm also able to get AR information so I can get guided tours and things like that. And it's not as antisocial, you know, as, as Google Glass was or something right. like that. And then further down the road, <coughs> I think um, hearables are very interesting. There's a lot of work going on at places like Dolby Labs and um, uh, Harman, Samsung and um, Bose and so on into you know smarter in-ears which are heavily customized uh, they might be customized with your own hrtf because obviously our, all of our hearing and our, our physiology is different so 3d audio is often not very convincing well it's, it's a hell of a lot more convincing after you have a personal hrtf brand, which i had and it just that was the first time i was really convinced by um, spatial audio um, so you could definitely see at a point in the future that people would be going into you know a spec savers or lens crafters and there's a booth in the corner where their heads are getting scanned they've got a 3d avatar now <clears throat> and they also come out of it with a sort of custom hrtf which would enable them to have customized in-ears which would you know not only do your your music and your communication but would also translate languages would you know have the health aspects of a smartwatch um, that uh, that could be doing, you know, spatial audio for all sorts of environments. Um, to go see the movies, you could choose to use your in-ear sound instead of the sound system. Ditto with your home entertainment system. And you could see that, that might be a four or five hundred dollar, um, you know, accessory that would become very hip. And I think, you know, customized accessories are definitely going to be a big deal in the future in, in malls and things like that, whether it's clothes or shoes or hats or whatever. Um, but I could definitely see that, you know, it'll be de rigueur to have your own custom uh, in-ears in the future. And beyond that, neural implants, I mean, it's bound to happen. Right, right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I teach at Johns Hopkins University and over in the medical campus, they've been doing cochlear implants for a while. And is that and for just impaired hearing or is it just... That's a, primarily yeah, for yeah, impaired yeah, hearing, yeah. although they are... They believe that the sort of stigma associated with hearing enhancement mm. will go away. Mm. Um, same way as you know, it doesn't mean that you're, you're visually impaired because you wear shades outdoors. Oh, you know. Right. Um, so, uh, and then you know, right next door to that are, are other departments that are using VR to help stroke victims and anxious kids before surgery mm. and. Um, uh, you know geriatric patients and things like that so and you know they have some funding in the in the medical campus so I can definitely see these things converging and it's great to be part of a conservatory that is in the middle of all of that scientific and medical research. Right. Do you try and kind of involve that in the music course or are they just it's kind of proximity or are they actually involved in the course that you're yeah, running. so so I've started an undergraduate Bachelor of Music in Music from New Media. So we're getting to the end of the first year. I only have the freshmen now. It's a four-year course. By the time they get into their third and fourth years, they will do capstone research projects with other, you know, collaborating with other uh, departments around Johns Hopkins. So if students chose to get involved with those medical um, projects, then they could definitely do that. Um, others may go to the film center and work on on VR films. Others may work with game designers in the School of Engineering and so on. So uh, they have a realm of different um, areas to, to do their individual projects in.
just just finishing up on on Synthplex, which is a brand new show, and um, you know Nam without the guitarists, you know, which mm -hmm. is which is kind of cool. How, how how do you think that the kind of generality of, of kind of synthness is developing with shows like this? I mean, yeah. do you think there's a future for this type of thing to, to really expand? Well, it, I mean, it's fantastic. This current resurgence in synthesis is great. Mm. You know, it seems to parallel vinyl in a way. That, mm -hmm. You know, you sort of take, again, that you know, the rarefied nature of uh, actually having to plug in a patch cord or twiddle a knob, you know, to make it sound rather than just you know, call up, a preset, you know, preset, yeah. right? <laughs> a preset um, is uh, definitely has an appeal in this day and age. So I'm, I'm delighted it's going on, and I've, I know there've been other shows like this, and you know, in Europe and uh, other parts of the world and the East Coast. So it's great that it's it's come to LA, and um, it's great that it's it's sort of grown out of a community of local musicians and keyboard players. Um, and I was very very flattered and honoured to be asked, and um, you know, fully aware that many of the newer generation of synthesis will have never heard of me probably uh, mm. tonight when I perform for them. It'll be a great opportunity mm. to. Uh, yeah, to, to blow their minds, I think there's no question. Yeah. yeah. Well, Tom, that's super. Thank you ever so much for getting up early and coming All down right. here. And good luck tonight, and okay. that's terrific. All right. Cheers, mate. All right.